Hey everybody, we're so delighted that you have spent this day with us. We are rounding out the morning and we've had some really interesting and informative conversations and this next one will be exactly the same. We all know that there are two international languages, music and sports. And we've got some extraordinary icons from both of those areas and we've got some business thrown in the mix. So let me introduce you to the folks that are going to be with us. I'm going to start out with Tony Ressler, who co-founded the private equity firms Apollo Global Management and Eris Management. I know Tony, though, not through the business side, but through the NBA. He's also the principal owner and chair of the board of the Atlanta Hawks. Thank you, Tony, for being here. We're so excited. We also have shortly coming with us will be T.I. from Atlanta. We all know T.I. who started rapping when he was nine years old and later signed his own record deal in 1999. He has become an entrepreneur and a businessman, starting his own record label, Grand Hustle Records. He's currently out with his 11th studio album, the L-I-B-R-A, the Libra. So excited about that. We also have Michael Renter in the house. Now, those of you might not know who that is, so let me break it down for you. Have you heard of Killer Mike? It's that dude. We love him here in Atlanta, a rapper, songwriter, actor, actor and activist. We are delighted to have him in studio with us. You might recall he has recently launched a digital banking platform called Greenwood. Their mission is to serve the black, Latinx and other underserved communities that have historically struggled to gain access to capital. So thank you, Mike, for what you've done and what you continue to do. Last but certainly not least, I got someone really exciting that's going to talk with all these gentlemen. My sister from another mister, Stephanie Rule. We all know she's the senior business correspondent for NBC News and anchors MSNBC Live with Stephanie Rule. I'm a fangirl, so yes, I see her every morning at 9 a.m. She previously served as an anchor and managing editor for Bloomberg Television following her tenure as a managing director at Deutsche Bank. Now, if this is not a group, we don't know what is. I'm going to throw it over to you, Stephanie. Go, girl. Thank you so, so much. Uh, I know T.I. is joining us in a sec. Mike, welcome. Thank Tony, you. welcome. Um, no better time than the present, Tony, to put the white rich guy on the spot. So how about we start with you? Um, in the last few weeks, we know that there was a bank CEO that got a huge amount of criticism because made, he made comments around the fact that Black people aren't getting the most senior positions in his organization because he just couldn't find them. And there was a lot of outrage about that, and it's justified. But it's not just about the jobs on the top. We keep, we keep misdiagnosing that. You have to go back in time. There's not people in positions to get those big jobs because they're not mid-level positions or entry-level positions. And you have to go further back than that. It's the basics around money and banking. Right. Money is that other international language. And we know that 17 percent of black households don't even have bank accounts, as opposed to three percent of white families. We know that for black small businesses, it's twice as hard for them to get funding. So this isn't just about why don't we see more black faces on top of corporate America. It goes all the way back to the beginning of financial education and opportunity equality. So given your career, your philanthropy, your vantage point, how do we start to solve from this at the bottom? Well, I think we have to start to solve for this from the bottom, the middle, the top. Uh, so please understand, uh, there are so many issues we could talk about, uh, but if we're talking about the private sector and what the private can do, must do, should do, you know, as far as I'm concerned, every company in America, every industry in America should have a plan on how they can become more diverse, how they can have a more diverse employee base, how they can help provide capital more attractively communities of color. This is all uh, under the category of both good business and the right thing to do. So please understand if a company, uh, it's not going to change overnight. But if you're not going to commit yourself to having a plan to become a more diverse business, and then I would argue 
a better business as a result, we're not going to make real change. And it's not just the private sector that I like to argue. It's the private sector and the public sector that have to work together. The public sector has to do its fair share, whether it's passing a CARES Act, whether it's raising minimum wage, whether it's providing subsidized health care, um, what I call Medicare for the poor, wh whether uh, generally, truly, whether it's providing K-12 education. There are all things the public sector can be doing. But what's most important is that the private sector doesn't just rely on the public sector, that every company and industry, as I say, have a plan to become more diverse, have methods by which capital becomes more attractive to communities of color, to entrepreneurs like Killer Mike. Can people access capital attractively and can they use it effectively? The private sector can help in that and should. Uh, I, I want to give you guys the heads up. Um, my lip reading skills are not great and I can't hear Tony speaking. So hopefully our audience did. Um, Michael, I want to turn to you. Um, you have been a prominent voice in music, social justice and activism for years. And when George Floyd was killed and you were speaking in Atlanta, you talked about people needing to activate and create positive change. We assumed you were talking about social justice, criminal justice reform, but you're actually taking action in the banking and finance world. Can you speak to that and explain to our audience what you're doing? Absolutely. Just making sure, like kindergarten class, everybody that can hear me raise their hand because I heard Tony. Okay, I can cool. Hear you. So I, I want to hear Mike. That, that that statement that you asked me um, is based in a philosophy I have of plot, plan, strategize, organize, and mobilize. And I learned that working in the 501c3 world in the world of organizing, where I learned that philosophy and made it my own. Um, under a woman named Alice Johnson and Reverend James Orange, formerly organized with SELC with Andrew Young and Martin. And people tend to think of social organizing only as a thing of, of society and social and political issues and things. They tend not to understand that in Martin's last years, his final two years, he talked about ending poverty, talked about um, leveling up economically an underserved community, blacks who had been basically locked out of being able to be capitalists in this system or being able to practice any type of effective capitalism past the communities they were locked in. He understood how that um, shrinking uh, also shrank greater society, stopped people from involving with one another. Um, so. Tony and what he was saying is absolutely right. You have to attack this problem on every single level. I would challenge the Wells Fargo CEO to adopt three classes in Atlanta and kindergarten and walk those kids through the next 13 years of school, specifically focusing on them and their families, financial literacy, intent on graduating his next year. I would also challenge him to do much like Brother Robert um, Smith did and underwrite a class at Morehouse or Clark or help to restore Morris Brown, specifically targeting building financiers. And then I'd pick, I cherry pick from other companies that are successful. There's a capitalist society. I go to black banks that are successful, look at the people running them and figure out a way to do business with them in order to strengthen their bank and take some diversity in my own organization. That's something that he's true to because this is the conversation we have on a biweekly basis when I call him for mentorship. I think that what we have lacked is the opportunity in this country due to racism, segregation, redlining, things of that nature. I think Tony is exactly right. Michael V. Smith are exactly right when they say that the private sector has a responsibility to be accountable, not only for philanthropic reasons, but what it does is you grow more talent. Football invests in country southern towns because that's where their talent comes from. Baseball invests in the Caribbean because that's where their talent comes from. And if we don't start to understand financially, if the private sector is not investing in this huge talent pool of young black kids who want to be in the finance, who want to be entrepreneurs, any kid who's cut grass wants to master money. And we can start to help people be financially literate as young as kindergarten. We can start helping kids understand that all, every, although everyone won't be LeBron, you can be his right-hand man and handle his money and his business deals. And we can be mentored by people like Tony and by corporations as, as a community. And if we take that responsibility to work in unison, no matter what sex, creed, color we are, not only does it help my community become financially stable, it helps the greater community. Because in capitalism, where you have more competition, usually it serves the customer better. Uh, well, the way capitalism should work best, Tony, is if we have more players competing in the game. Instead of, and I apologize if you said any of this before, I wasn't able to hear you. 
does it not make more business sense to address this? You know, when Mike was talking about sports, it makes me think of the sport of lacrosse. There is no correlation between being good at lacrosse and pursuing and succeeding in a career on Wall Street. But you know what there is? An extraordinary network. That sport happens to know a lot of guys who work in banking. And those guys in banking introduce them because banking finance is a different language. And if you never know that language, you can never play the game. Does it not behoove a truly capitalist society to say, we need to teach more people this language so we can get the best players in the game? So uh, I'm thrilled to repeat myself, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and to, but, Sorry. Uh, no, no. So please understand that the truth of the matter is every company, every industry that can grow its employee base to be more diverse, but to position them for success, you know, rather than criticize whatever the banker at Wells Fargo was trying to, uh, to communicate, clearly not as effectively as maybe he wished, you know, every industry, the investment industry, the asset management industry is working with certainly my company and others working with HBCUs to help with curriculum that the kids at school today, uh, no disrespect to Killer Mike and go into third grade, which is great. I want to see K-12 education improve, but we could go to HBCUs today, help with curriculum to make sure that the students in HBCUs are better prepared for success set management business by just helping in curriculum and folks that have had that experience because just as you correctly point out there there aren't enough people of color in the finance industry in the asset management industry and when that changes so will the roles in mid-level and senior change but it has to start somewhere and creating more diversity in virtually every significant business Banking and finance, top of the list, should be happening, should have been happening years ago, of course, and it has been happening to a degree, but not nearly to the degree the country requires. And, and, and I, that's I, our I, job. And, you know, and I, I don't want to pick on the Wells Fargo CEO, and I remember when he said it, it drew huge criticism, but, but there's sort of this ugly truth on the surface that at some level he could say, I look at the numbers, and maybe he has a point. There aren't people eligible for those top jobs, which is why you need to solve for it at, at, a, at a much more base level. Mike, how much do you attribute this to simply not knowing the language, not knowing the language of money or investing or raising money? Well, let me let Tony know we were definitely in agreement on the HBCUs, which is why I brought up Robert Smith. So private sector, it's a bunch of kids in from from Alabama to Tuskegee to more and Clark that need you. So come on, swoop in with those curriculums that are going to help teach the kids those money. So I agreed with him from the beginning. I agree now we can start at basement, middle and top level. So what I would say to him is, you know, unlike everyone else, I don't care to see him nailed to the cross as much. I'd rather see him come out of that moment having learned something and saying, well, this is what's actionable and this is what we're going to do. I don't know the language. A lot of times I'll wake up in the morning. My wife, um, Shana, who's tremendously smarter than me with a coin, um, will, will say something or an idea and I'll have to call Tony at nine in the morning. And remember, it's six in L.A. Maybe you should call a little later and says, hey, I'm going to get this much money. My instinct says I make enough money yearly. OK, we don't want anything extra. Maybe I should put that away and focus on not not pulling and buying a new Lamborghini or Ferrari. And he'll say gut wise, your wife's instincts are right. And here's why. This is how you grow and compound interest. This is what you do versus simply paying 45 percent of your taxes. So I'm learning, but I'm learning a new language. So her instincts that are just base raw minimum. She was raised by a woman who ran a shot house. So she thinks a coin very differently, very differently than I do. Her gut instincts are right. And he has taught us the language. I think if that happens in school before grad school, if it happens freshman year, if it happens senior year going into freshman year, you come out in four or five years with the population that's financially literate, ready to teach that to their, 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 their family members as they go along. But beyond that, they're ready to enter the banking sector. They're ready to enter the finance sector in a way that's going to individually grow them and grow their money in their communities of color.
Uh, Tony, from a philanthropic standpoint, I know I'm going off on a limb a little bit here. You've done a ton over the course of your life in terms of education. How much does that base education, not just a, not just a financial education, but a strong education, give the next generation of, of kids the foundation to pull themselves to move up from a socioeconomic standpoint? A quality K-12 education, access to affordable college or career studies is critically important. And everyone knows it. the question is, how do you improve K-12 education? But just one example, to Mike's point, why isn't 12th grade, every high school senior should graduate with finance under his or her belt that says, here's how I open a checking account. Here's how I take out a small business loan. This is the importance of compounding yeah. in my investment account no one takes and is required to take as a senior in high school and comes out and doesn't know how to take a car loan or open a checking account what am i missing black what, white what are, why is it that way why is it that way why did i take calculus in high school and i don't know how to do my taxes because we're trying to I grow rocket scientists or or production workers versus growing people who really or want to participate or have the ability to participate in this country's economy. And I think that we need to radically change schools in that way. But that's my opinion. I'm going to let Tony give his. I just interjected there. And I hate on this issue, we are a thousand percent in agreement. <laughs> Listen, Bill Gates passed and funded, from what I understand, trying to put science, math in high school across this country, in curriculums across high school. I, I salute that. I, I, I welcome that. But basic finance that says when you come out of high school, you know how to buy a house with a home mortgage, to open a checking account, you know the power of compounding, you know the difference between a stock and a bond. This is critically important for this country. It's critically important for people of color coming out of high school. It's critically important for white people. It's critically important for Asian people. But the, the, the reason this doesn't exist could be more complicated than they're willing to discuss today, but that curriculum should and could change, but it's all part of sending the message that frankly folks like Mike are far more influential than folks like me, which is we have to introduce basic financial literacy across this country and it will help people better themselves and the private sector and the public sector should be teaming up to do just that. And people with real voices should be using them. Absolutely. But Tony, I, I think that's maybe the most important point. While Mike has tremendous impact and influence, it's the partnership with people in your position that are really going to get us to the next level. Michael, how do you look at, right? So, so nine months ago before COVID hit, we may have been missing the boat on some of our economic vulnerabilities because it was a huge quote unquote win for our economy that the unemployment number was so low yeah. that black unemployment had made such great strides yeah but a job doesn't mean it's a job that can support you because all of a sudden covid hit and we saw it disproportionately hit black and brown communities yes. and even many people that had a job didn't have enough to support themselves yes so having a job isn't that putting uh, scotch tape on a much bigger gaping hole problem? A absolutely. C considering or looking at it like, well, at least you got a job is not the good enough. The, 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 at a certain point, the goal shouldn't be to cure cancer. It should be to prevent cancer. But since we're living with cancer, we have to admit that at one point, a hundred and something days ago, 200 and something days ago, it had gotten better and my community got a glimpse of some stability. But the truth is we have never been stable. We were not stable during times of slavery because we were used as economic commerce. We were not stable for the years after Reconstruction because we were destabilized by things like Jim Crow, redlining, the promise of GI bills that never came, um, underfunded neighborhoods. So we've never had true stability. So I think that rather than argue the points of was it better with lower unemployment or better now, it begins for me to say, well, what can we do right now as a form of triage to stop the bleeding 
and do what we can in the maximum to correct that. And in the very maximum, what we can do is start a campaign, if nothing else, to start basic financial literacy. I didn't join Greenwood, the bank, just because I thought America needed another bank. I knew that there were special problems on Martin Luther King, a couple streets up from where I grew, a couple streets up from where T.I. grew up. There were special problems there. We saw banks move brick and mortar locations. We saw liquor stores and check cashing places come in. We saw families that were moving with $200 a week all of a sudden have 160 because they were being charged 20 percent on a dollar cash checks. So my thing was, if there's a digital platform that will provide an opportunity for people to keep all their money so that instead of spending that $40 simply to cash, they can now save 20, they can put 20 in a long-term saving, they can save 20 for their Christmas or whatever. That is the beginning. And I say that because I'm not being idealistic. I'm not a rich rapper that's always been rich as this has happened. I grew up a poor and working class kid from three streets from Martin Luther King. I grow up there. My grandparents who grew up on pennies in the very rural South managed to save enough money to buy one rental property that helped subsidize raising my sisters and I. Now that's not the old American dream of MTV Cribs, but that is the very real American dream of we are at the start of wealth for our community. Black people are only 57 years free. And the generation that's my age, that's in mid forties and mid thirties up to mid fifties are going to have to start seeing ourselves as a foundational cornerstone for our grandchildren versus saying, I want it all now. We're not going to get it all now. If you are fortunate enough to make hundreds of thousands, a million dollars or to make or to gain any asset to leave to your children and their children, you should not only be learning about financial literacy at base level, you should be learning what a trust is. Because I knew at 24 I was too stupid to keep anything my grandparents left me. So thank God they waited till I was in my 30s before they died. Because if I would have been 24, I would have just sold my grandma's house which is now worth triple the value and my sister lives in it and can now pull out equity and make sure her son has a better education. But I didn't know that because I didn't know that from school. I knew that because two old people who were burly with money raised me. So I think that on a very base level, people who look like me, people who are my age can start taking the self accountability of learning to be financially literate. We can start making sure our children are. And from the public and private sector, we need allies and we need people investing in us and investing in our communities so that we can start to generationally grow in the way that America has promised and given every other group, but we have only had 57 years of a peek into it. Michael was blessed with grandparents who were focused on wealth creation, even if it wasn't a great deal of wealth. T.I., to Michael's point, we need to make sure that next generation is financially literate. How do we do that if we are not? How do we start to turn the page and not just ensure that people have jobs, but that they understand wealth creation, real estate, uh, owning your own real estate, starting to, to, to in, being an investor doesn't mean that you're wealthy. It means that you're building a foundation. How do we start getting the African community there? Um, well, I think that, uh, that I, I, I believe there are three things that plague our communities that kind of keep us downtrodden, um, especially financially. That's the, the lack of education. Uh, the lack of opportunities and the lack of exposure. Okay, now we have substandard education in our public school systems uh, versus the public school systems that are available to our Caucasian neighbors across town in Buckhead rather than Bankhead where I grew up. Uh, we have much less opportunity to go around to all of the people within the community of Bankhead uh, than our Caucasian neighbors have in Buckhead and much much less exposure uh, to create ambition and vision for for the future of tomorrow for our children uh, on Bankhead rather than Buckhead. So if we can get better education for our children and our neighbors over on the west side, if we can get better opportunities for our children and our neighbors on the west side and better exposure, more exposure to things to create uh, higher levels of ambition, higher levels of expectation, higher standards uh, for ourselves and our children to reach, I think that will allow us to not only teach with words, but to be able to have people in my generation set a visual example that can be followed. You know what I mean? You can replicate it, you can scale it, but it's there. Yeah, you know I mean, so I think those are the things that, that, that we really, really need to get to our communities uh, as, as quick and fast as possible. Tony, what do you think, especially as it relates 
to business creation and real estate, right? When we have particular communities, generation after generation living rental lives, they don't build anything. But again, to what T.I. and Mike just said, um, you know, please understand this is a public and private discussion. As T.I.'s point, you have to improve K-12 education in minority communities. You have to improve to affordable health care. You have to push the public sector, just as you're highlighting, we have to, every meaningful player in the private sector has to lead by example. And becoming more diverse oh, no. and helping in financial literacy is all part of the issue. And, and by the way, people like I and Mike, and please understand, these guys are not just uh, in the musical world. They're supposed to lead by example and are as entrepreneurs. Damn, every NBA player, 80% of the NBA is African-American, making over $8 million a year on average. Think of how special each one of those should be the entrepreneur of their community in their post-playing days with just a bit of financial literacy and focus. And believe me, every one of these NBA players has the intelligence, the competence, the ability, and mentorship available to them. And, and truly, being the entrepreneur of your community often does a lot more than sometimes just being uh, the best basketball player in your community. Um, Mike, maybe I'm naive, but COVID exposed so many failures in our society, specifically in our education system and the substandard education so many kids are getting. We're seeing it happen at this very moment. At this very moment, my three kids are in person going to their schools and getting basically the same education they would get any other year. Yeah. We are seeing poor kids in this country, specifically in African American communities, not even get their basic education. Is there a chance that there is a silver lining here? that we're in such a crisis, we can take these ingredients that you're discussing and actually create that change, one that should have happened years ago but didn't. What, what I would like to see happen, I'll tell you about Atlanta. So T.I. and I are both from the west side. Um, the west side um, is an enclave, an African-American enclave. I specifically am from the Collier Heights. is an African-American enclave created by African-Americans for African-Americans. We also know that as technology crept up, um, it got left behind, you know, fiber optic wiring, cell towers, things of that nature. What I would ideally like to see in Atlanta happen, say, in the next 180 days, is you take a company like Figures Wireless, which is, I think, the only black wireless or cell phone company. If you need them to partnership with the bigger company partnership, but if not, I think they could do it themselves. You get Figures, a contract with city and state, to wire that whole side of town up, which would then take a whole district, a school district named for John Lewis, and it would make it from a from a wireless standpoint um, equivalent to what happens in North Fulton where kids can get on wireless easy so even if kids can't pour back into qualified schools like Frederick Douglass or Jean Child's Young School in the physical what they will have is the proper wireless in their homes a company a company that's in the company to make money but that understands that community needs figures wireless could facilitate that and if the school board and city could find the money to do that that would be an amazing win until those children could then go repopulate a Frederick Douglass High School, which is a big enough school, I think, for 2,000 kids. So not only do you have competent kids coming back that have not missed a step, you would then have a school that opens up, has some financial literacy courses in 11th and 12th grade, and also in the basement would have mechanical drafting like it once did, welding like it once did, and art, where I learned all my financial literacy from an art teacher who owned a funeral home and a bunch of land around the Georgia Dome. Mr. Murray. I'll tell you something else. Mike, I'll tell you what else we could do, Killer Mike. Yes, sir. Why not also take the Russell Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship Absolutely. and make it the best example, the best example in America Absolutely. of how someone as a one-stop shop for both access to capital and mentorship for all minority-owned businesses Absolutely. that grow and use that as a prototype for what every large market in this country should have. And I so having both access to capital and mentorship in one location. And I'd like to say this to cool black people who make a lot of money. Stay in your neighborhoods and help those neighborhoods be better. The Russell Center, started by Herman Russell's legacy is children and more. Herman Russell lived about four streets behind me. Much bigger house, as our house was only about 900 square feet. 
But his house was the house that we rode our bikes by to look at so that I knew that the opportunity to have something was about four streets behind me if I kept the straight path and followed it. I knew that the opportunity for greatness was right behind me in Billy McKinney's house, in Major Baugh's house. So it was an economically diverse community I lived in, even though it was black. It was economically diverse, and I would like to encourage more people from my community that make it to stay or reinvest in those communities. Um, like Tony was saying, we should be the entrepreneurs in these communities, and we should be re <clears throat> and not just allowing for gentrifying. Um, I, I, I agree with everything that's being said here. However, I do think that there is an elephant in the room that must be addressed. The curriculum for education comes from the top down and it's not altruistic at all. Uh, it, 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 it is intentionally uh, doctrinating certain thoughts, ideals, and, and celebration of certain so-called heroes that go directly against the forward thinking progression of the fair and decent people of America. You know, uh, I think that has to be addressed as well, whether that's a group of us, as we spoke, uh, as we spoke of before offline, a group of us get together and do some sort of a school as, as LeBron did in Cleveland with I Promise, where we create the curriculum, uh, because outside of, you know, just reading, writing and arithmetic, there are other things being taught in the educational system that kills the confidence of young black kids before they can even get started. I think that they're more, uh, there's more time and attention in, in, in public schools spent on how to break the free spirit and the individual thoughts of, 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 of the independent thoughts of a child that comes from that area so they can be put in line once they step outside in, in, into the free world. And you teach them that out, out from celebrating Christopher Columbus as the guy who discovered America to uh, 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 to the, the Georgia history. Who's that guy? Ulysses S. Grant. And, you know, all those all those white supremacists carved into the side of Stone Mountain. Well, now, Grant's not one of those. That was Grant, like, that's yeah, a union yeah, guy? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. my bad. Well, who's yeah, the other yeah. guy? Who's the other guy? Well, what we're talk, you're, you're talking Robert, about, like, Robert, Alexander Stevens Robert on that Robert Lee side. or something like that? General yeah, Lee? Robert or, Lee or, yeah, Robert Lee Yeah, okay, yeah. Guys. Well, those guys. Those guys. Okay. <laughs> anyway, but if you teach our children... Not that Grant was much better, but... <laughs> okay, got you, got you. But, it, but, but if you teach our children to celebrate these guys as heroes, Absolutely. then you're essentially telling them that... That slavery was deserved yeah. you understand so I think that subconsciously in the psyche of of a, of a, of a child no less is is just as impactful well, and, and as I, th I think that I think that a cool thing we could do is to start to teach that capitalism even existed there the people who were owned understood they were property they understood what they were but I often used to say to my grandparents well how did someone buy themselves out of slavery mm. when they was working for free right but my grandfather even before I learned this in college they, did, they waited to college to tell me this but my grandfather was like well if you had one day off you had Sundays off Every white man who had a farm wasn't rich enough to own people. They could rent themselves out to someone else. They understood I am valuable, the uh. skills I have, so you need a fence built. You don't own anyone. I'm going to charge you to build this fence. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to split that with the person that owns me. What? I'll use my savings to not only buy myself out of slavery, to also buy my family. So I just, I just want that said because oftentimes when we speak of being enslaved, we speak from a total place of victimization as though these people had really been regulated to beasts yeah. and they weren't able to think and they were able to think all the way through. And even though they didn't master themselves or their own bodies, they mastered finance as early as being able to accumulate enough wealth to buy themselves out of freedom. And that is a radically different teaching that all Americans should know. True. That, that enters two human beings versus a human being now, making now, someone now, simply a beast. Now, when you say that, I, I, that's definitely a different, is, is viewing it through a different lens. Uh, I think that's kind of, you know, uh, the micro rather than the macro. I, I, I'm trying to say... Um, no, I agree with you. I was just oh, saying, in likewise. addition to the unteaching, but we got to teach that black people been about money a long time. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. We've, been, we've been taking the worst and making the best of it forever. That's absolutely. the same way. That's, that's why trap music is here, because of the cracker. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? The cracker. We've made more money off rapping about crack 
then we then and people Elba made on crack. crack. You see what I'm saying? So we've always, right, we need for we've to go always been making the best of, <laughs> of a bad situation. But I'm saying, like, as, as Malcolm X talked, uh, anyone who's still depending on their oppressor to educate their children is lost. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? You would never in a Jewish community find Jewish parents sending their children to a school that celebrated Hitler and, and praised him as a hero. Absolutely. You just would not do it. However, African Americans or black people, uh, we, 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 we do that every day. And I think that is a huge part of, of, of the cycle that we're in, that we're stuck in when it comes to education. Tony, I want you to help us make the business case of this public-private partnership that it's not just about businesses are so successful, they should give back. Help us understand why it makes sense for business. Look at Atlanta. If, if the city of Atlanta was bigger, stronger, better, smarter, when people came into town to go to Hawks games, they wouldn't be going to the game and then leaving again and going back out to their house in the suburbs. Now, if you invest in communities, in cities, in businesses, everyone will thrive, including that business in top, on top. So it's not just a philanthropic effort. It's a business case. Listen, the private sector should do what they think is both the right thing and good business. And by the way, as T.I. is saying, the private sector should influence a change in curriculum in public education. No question about it. And just as an aside, if you look at Wing today and I... I'm not trying to brag or anything, but if you look at what we're doing in State Farm Arena right now, Atlanta and Fulton counties had a real problem. It just coincidentally, it's not a coincidence. I don't want to be cynical. You know, African-American communities had three, four, five hour waits to vote. You come to State Farm Arena, you're in and out in 90 minutes. That's a public private partnership. We're getting over 20 percent of the voters in Fulton County putting their vote in Fulton County at State Farm Arena. And by the way, we have 300 Hawks employees helping that go smoothly. Yes, we are proud of it, but that is a public-private partnership that is making voting go more effectively in Fulton County. That's a good thing. And there's a whole lot of good things that the private sector could influence the public sector to do, and it will make for a better country. And it's just well, that, that simple to me. Tony, you should be proud of it, and I'll tell you, uh, we are certainly grateful for it because the work that you're doing, T.I., Mike, the advocacy and the efforts that you are putting forth is certainly going to help more people rise and definitely the next generation. I want to thank all of you for participating today, and of course, as always, I want to thank help John. I want to thank John Hope Bryant. There is no other person in this country taking on income inequality and financial literacy quite like he is. I'm lucky to know. Thank you guys so, so much. There's no doubt. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Good to see you, Tony. Thank you, guys.